Hey there, I'm Meredith Noble, author, coach, and co-founder of LearnGrantWriting.org. If you are charging your services hourly, you are literally punishing yourself for becoming more valuable. In this video, we are going to be talking about how do you stop charging hourly and shift to a value-based pricing model. You're going to learn how to renegotiate contracts that you have with existing clients and how to go forth as you're contracting from here on out. Why? Because we both know that you want to be spending a lot more time enjoying your life this year, not working it all away on hourly based work. All right, with that, let's hit it. pumped up to charge more and then it's going to cause you to be like, I don't know, can I do it? We need to have a conversation on why this matters, why we need to have a look at our money beliefs. And that means we need to talk about the recession and inflation and what that means for you. All right, inflation. We have had 15% inflation since 2020. That means that you need $115 to buy an item that cost you $100 two years ago. September 2022 was the highest month in 40 years for the rate at which inflation was increasing. We're all feeling this and we have to respond to it. I'm skeptical that the inflation is not much worse than 15% and closer to 25%. Here's why. The consumer price index, which is what the Federal Reserve looks at when they are sharing what the inflation rate is, does not account for rent or housing. And I don't know about where you live, but COVID made housing go bananas and many of Myself and many on my team actually bought a house for the first time this year, and it was amazing how literally on a weekly basis, the cost for lending was going up. Also, the number that's often referenced by the Federal Reserve is misleading because they often use the CPI-U. I forget what the U stands for, but essentially it excludes food and energy costs because those are volatile. And hello, that's what actually affects our budget. That's what we actually are all as consumers looking at and living with. And so if you don't account for housing, you don't account for food, and you don't account for energy costs in terms of more cost at the pump and also in heating your home, what else is really moving the needle for your budget? So if your pay is not keeping pace with inflation, so if you have not experienced a 15% pay increase minimum in the last two years, you probably haven't, you're effectively taking a pay cut. You are going to work, working for less every year. And you compound that over a few years and it really, really sets you back, which is why a lot of people are turning to things like grant writing as an option for, okay, I need a side hustle or a new career. Okay, so what this means for you is that besides the fact that you're probably really frustrated with your monthly budget, we have to challenge our assumptions. So what numbers have you latched onto as a fair wage? What number feels like dream money to make. You've got it in your head. I know you do. I have it as well. Now, it was okay to have those numbers because we were experiencing 2% inflation every year for the last decade or so. And that's what pay was increasing with and everything was moving along nicely. And so inflation was keeping pace with what our pay was growing at. And so these numbers could kind of stay stagnant. But all of a sudden, a $70,000 salary, which was pretty great, not very long ago, now really is not anything near enough. And it's not as much as it had, you know, really used to be literally just five years ago. So we have to take a moment to look at these numbers we've latched onto, write them down, declare them, because guess what? They're not relevant anymore and we need to define new numbers. Side note, if you're looking for some reading on this topic, I cannot recommend highly enough. Rachel Rogers book, We Should All Be Millionaires. Even if you scoff at the concept of like, oh, I don't need to be a millionaire. Well, that's probably all the more reason that you need to read this book. So it's basically mandatory reading for anyone that joins the Global Grant Writing Collective. And in fact, today is our book club that we host. And this is this month's book. So it's been top of mind. Highly recommend. Why do we charge hourly in the first place? Number one, it's easy, right? Number two, it's simple. I guess that's sort of the same thing, but you get the idea. Like it's easy. It's a straightforward way to charge. You have the third reason unknown variables, right? You don't know maybe what it's going to take to do it. So you need, you feel like you need to do it hourly. The fourth reason is industry. I'm going to put in quotations standard, which we think we have to follow. But what I'm going to challenge you on is that industry standards are nothing really more than just a suggestion or a way. Yeah, it's been mass done, but it's not the way it's necessarily needs to be done moving forward. For instance, grant writers used to get paid a percentage of the grants they would write. That is no longer considered ethical or best practice or even allowed almost always by funders themselves. 
So maybe that was industry standard for a while and it's not anymore. Here's the other issue. When you're charging hourly, the organization is often comparing their hourly rate to what you're charging hourly and they have a heart attack. But that's because they're not appreciating the fact that their office is paid for, that they get a 401k benefit. They don't have to pay taxes on their payroll. They don't have a business development cost. They get paid their 40 hours a week. But the problem is people still do that math and they don't wanna pay you more than they're receiving themselves. Another thing that we have found is that executive directors that make under 75K a year are the ones that have the hardest time paying for professional services. So that's why how you may start like reframing and getting away from just thinking about something in an hourly way where we're comparing and we're getting into that situation, which is nothing but downward pressure on yourself. That's why we shift to value-based pricing. So what is the problem exactly with charging hourly? This is literally it in one sentence. The better, faster, more valuable you get. So I'm gonna say faster, but fill in the blank. The what money you make. Let's pretend this is Jeopardy. The less money you make. I'm gonna give you an example so you can see this from a real monetary perspective. All right, case study. I was asked to write two Indian community development block grants on pretty short notice. I had efficiencies and expertise with this grant, which is why I was able to do it on short notice. I've done them several before and had many funded. So now comes the dilemma. Do I give this client a proposal charging hourly or do I charge on value-based pricing? So in terms of charging hourly, I had a, let's say a hundred dollar rate, I think it's what it was at the time, times the 120 hours it's gonna take for me to pull off both of these slash that's literally all the hours I could possibly extract before the deadline hit because again, they were rushing this. So that means if charging hourly, I would bill them $12,000 for both proposals. But when I account for value-based pricing, which is the fact that I have some efficiencies because I've already done this grant before and I can look at old proposals that were successful and like I literally know what I'm doing. I know these communities, I know this client. So instead I said the fee is $7,500 per proposal. So times two applications means I bill the client actually 15,000. So that difference from 12 to 15 is 3K in a one month alone of work. And so if you extrapolate three times 12, right, that's actually 36 grand I would have been making that year if that's like my regular cadence of project work, which it was. But here's the thing, that really doesn't even account for now what I would charge. And I, I would charge at least $12,000, if not even $15,000 for each application, because that really truly is representative of the value put into these proposals and what it's worth. So if we look at that, let's say I did actually charge what that proposal was worth. I was way undercharging. That was a federal grant for $7,500. Like that's the bottom someone should ever charge. Okay. I'd be making $24,000 to do two proposals versus the 12,000 if charged hourly. So now you're looking at a really radical difference that again, you multiply across your whole year. And that's the difference between having a 70, 80, 90, maybe K revenue year and being at that 250 K a year revenue mark, which is what we teach too. Value-based pricing was something that my mentor taught me. And so it's my great pleasure to be teaching it to you. And how we managed to handle this was my, when COVID hit and I'm getting inundated with grant requests, I ended up hiring a bunch of students, many that were total noobs from my program, my online grant writing class, hired them on, brought on Alice, Alex, she's the blonde here, so she was a project manager. She did five hours a week to help me manage these grants. And we had over 20K months every month that year because we'd fine tune the project management, we were doing value-based pricing, and we'd really dialed in, how do you do flash assembly of teams? And really what it all revolved around that allowed us to make that kind of money and get those results for our clients was because we were doing value-based pricing. Almost never was it hourly. All right, you're probably wondering, okay, got it. So not gonna charge hourly, what is value-based pricing? All right, it is the sum of the hours required to do the project, hang with me, your specialized expertise, what it is worth to your client, and the time to deliver it. And I'd actually like to add a fifth in there, which is what you are personally otherwise saying no to. Okay, this is what I love about grant writing so much because the ROI is better than anything else. So let's say I charge $20,000 to do a big federal grant. We secure $600,000. That is a 30 to one ratio in terms of what they're putting in and what they're getting out of it, right? So that's remarkable. But then we wanna go beyond just the dollar amount. It's like, okay, is this 600 grand funding several new positions or keeping positions going? Or is this funding a really important program that would have otherwise had to have been cut? Or is this grant helping actually secure 
another two or three grants because getting this one in the door first helped show the others that there is support. And all of a sudden you start looking at these other tangential and secondary benefits beyond just the grant amount itself. And you realize there is a lot of value to your client. Would they even be going after it if not for you because they don't actually have the time to do it? So think about that. Spend a little time to really quantify what is it worth to my client to go after this project? And in our instance, to go after this grant application. Okay, third one is looking at time to deliver. So one time I was asked to do a Department of Energy grant in five days. That is insane. Okay, Department of Energy grants are brutally, brutally tough. It was very complex, but I knew the client. I knew the project pretty well. There was great uh, momentum already done on this project. And otherwise I just worked my tush off. Now, if I had charged hourly, I would have made whatever, 40 hours times a hundred dollars. I think it's what is, I should know the math to this, but it's not very much, right? That's what it would have taken if I was just charging hourly. But there, this grant was secured $750,000 for them and they would not have got it at all if they hadn't had that extra emergency time, someone to actually put their energy into going after it, right? So because they wanted it on a very expedited schedule, you better believe I charged a lot more for it and you should be as well. So don't assume this is the thing about why value-based pricing is important because if you're just charging hourly, you're literally punishing yourself for working really hard for organizations and only charging hourly. Okay, and number four is your specialized expertise. And I'll be honest with you, this is a little bit hard to calculate. Let's look at an example. All right, let's break down how you calculate it. First, we do start with looking at what are the hours required to complete that scope of work. Here is the profit building fee calculator we provide within our program. So basically you fill out each task. In this example, that's the funding strategy and subsequent tasks are doing different grant applications. I'm breaking it down, really thinking it through. You have to do this anyway. This is how you make, whether you're charging hourly, or value-based pricing, you have to really think this through and looking at, okay, what, what are the rates that I'm paying other team members that I'm working with? And if you're not working with a team, missing out, even if you just work with someone for a few hours, it's so valuable. And then any subcontractors you might be working on, any expenses, and that gives us our total cost. So this helps really think through what is required to deliver the project. This means this is the minimum amount that we would charge. Minimum amount because the estimate for hourly time put into the project. So that's step one. Step two is what is it worth to your client? The reason that it's a little bit hard to calculate what your specialized expertise is worth is because we all chronically undervalue ourselves. And if something comes easily to us, we don't value it very much, even though what comes easily to us is someone else's nightmare. All right, here's an example. So I charged $18,000 for a federal grant that was worth $350,000. I'm going to break down how some of that was actually charged hourly in a moment. But I saved that client $70,000 thousand dollars because I knew this program that we were going after, I had done a grant with it in the past, that we could get out of the 20% match requirement. Match means how much money the applicant has to put in to be able to unlock that grant funding. So not only did they not have to pay that because I was able to show that they had um, undue hard times during COVID and therefore could not come up with that money. So they got 100% grant funding and like that is something that factors into my specialized expertise. Like I could bring that to the table that someone else might not have been able to bring. Yes, picture on the right is of half of our team when we got together this year. But this project actually ended up being a combination of value-based pricing and hourly. So originally I had charged $12,000 for the grant, but we had extra unforeseen work by the funder that we really could not possibly have anticipated. So what I did was issue a contract amendment, adding a $10,000 lump sum to the bill that we could bill against hourly as needed. So I was under contract to bill up to $22,000 for this grant, but I ended up only billing to 18K because it ended up not needing as much time as I had budgeted for. So this is what you do if all of a sudden you are in a situation where you realize, oh shoot, there's a lot more to this than either party could have anticipated. Obviously it's not an ideal situation. You wanna get it right the first time, but it does happen. And this is one tool where hourly is appropriate when those unknowns are just way too significant. The last consideration I want you to think about is 
what is your time worth to you? What are you saying no to? It took me a long time to get the Global Grant Writing Collective spun up. Okay, it took a couple tries. And one of the hardest decisions I had to make was letting go of a client that I had a $45,000 a year contract with so that I could focus exclusively on the collective and building up an online course experience. I had to let that go and it was really, really hard. It's like, well, what's this worth to me? Like that money is valuable, but it was taking so much time I couldn't build the other thing I really wanted to build. So you are going to be at potentially a similar juxtaposition. And I want you to really think about if I take on this client or this project or whatever, what am I otherwise saying no to? And be honest with yourself. And all too often, that thing that we're saying no to is ourselves. And we don't want to make a habit out of that. Before I give you the exact fees that we are giving our clients within the collective on what to be charging in 2023, I wanna be talking about, well, how do you charge? So we have exclusively value-based pricing, which is typically that lump sum that we then bill by percentage of work complete. So if it's a $20,000 lump sum project and I do 30% of it in month one, then I'm gonna bill $6,000. And then the rest of the work in month two, I would then bill the 14,000 in month two. So it's a lump sum, build by percentage of work complete. That's my favorite. Sometimes you do value-based pricing and an hourly lump sum. So that's the example I gave you of, you know, the value set X, it's a lump sum, but plus a budget that is approved to be spent, but maybe won't get spent because you're just gonna eat off that on an hourly basis. And that helps kind of de-risk things for both you and who you're working with if there are certain elements of your project that are way too variable, right? Or the retainer. But I put this with the big old asterisk because while it's great for you to have predictable monthly income, and if you are doing truly predictable activities like social media management, or you are writing two blog posts a month. That's very predictable. That is super reasonable for a retainer. So cool. But if you're doing anything that is not very, very predictable, and it's more of a project or program based work, then it's not entirely appropriate because you're going to be always trying to work the least amount of hours as possible so that you're getting the best value out of your retainer. And they're going to be wanting to get the most out of you. And those ups and downs in terms of the workload and what you're actually getting paid can create some resentment on both sides. So an alternative is getting a lump sum agreed upon and a certain percentage of that is billed every month. So let's say that you have a $24,000 lump sum approved for the year. Like they've gone to their board, they've planned it, it's set aside in the budget to have you because hey, that's still cheaper than a full-time person or part-time even, right? So you're gonna bill, let's say $1,000 a month as your retainer for the things that you for sure are gonna be doing every single month. And then that additional $12,000 that you're not billing billing every month, that would be on a more cyclical basis based on the rising and falling of project-based work. So maybe in the month of March, you bill $4,000, but in the subsequent months, you're not billing anything beyond that $1,000 retainer amount. And that allows you to be paid very equitably for those peaks and valleys that occur instead of trying to assume that every day is the same for you, unless you really, truly, really, truly are doing retainer work. All right. So let's jump into some common q and A I I received when I was giving a presentation on value-based pricing with the Writer Society that I think you'll find valuable as well. All right, so how do you figure out how much value you're generating for a client when the content has no direct payoff? For example, a blog article. And I said, oh no, there is payoff for the work you're doing. And if not, you have a major offer problem or you do not understand your customer's pains well enough. For example, you can go into this tool called Uber Suggest. That's where I have the screenshot from. They tell you about how websites are performing. If you look at the top performing sites on our website, we have three, four, and five are both blog posts. So a review of the top 20 online grant writing classes, review of top 10 grant databases. If you look at, okay, I have an estimated visit of 2,248 visitors every month and a certain percentage of those will give us their email and then they become, they're in my email sequence and then a certain percentage of those are going to buy, which is about 4% right now. So I can literally calculate that. Okay. That's 89. So we'll say 90 times right now. Our price of the collective is $3,000, definitely going up. So the value 
value of that blog post to me, no joke, is $269,000. That is how valuable that blog post is to me over time, right? That's why you can do those sorts of calculations as well. You can take your client's website and go put that into Ubersuggest and see how many visits they're getting or look at some of your past writing and how well it's doing in terms of indexing with Google so that you can show those kind of results. Because I guarantee if you're not giving those kinds of results, then again, we wanna really rework and rethink how you are delivering value. Second question, is value-based pricing unpredictable for the client? No, there are a lot of ways to structure it. We just went through that. The biggest thing I want you to think about is for your client's perspective. Will I need to write a proposal for every project I take on with a client or will we end up with a reusable rate like if they always want similar length content? Great question. So the answer is definitely no, you do not need to write a proposal. Think about your customer. They're busy people. They don't wanna be signing new contracts with you every other week. So instead you wanna make it preferably a once a year purchase decision. Yes, we have to often start with the dating project that's something smaller. I'll talk about that in a moment. But once you have that relationship established, that's why I'm a big fan of do a large value-based priced lump sum that you can then bill against throughout the year. How do I explain pricing when clients try to make sense of it based on word count or time? For example, I quote $400 for a 1000 word article and they say 40 cents per word, right? They're freaking out. Two thoughts occur for this question. Could be a client problem. So do they actually value your work? And within the collective, we teach two tests, the unicorn client test and the five-year test. Here's the five-year test for you. Could I see myself working with them for five years or more? And if you can't imagine a truly long-term relationship with them, they're probably not a unicorn client. And those are the ones that we want because they value you and they pay accordingly. Second, it is your responsibility to reposition beyond an industry standard. So get away from this. Basically, there's certain language like this, for instance, where people freak out about 40 cents per word or in our space, people freak out about hourly. And we can get away from that because certain spaces have a real scarcity mindset. The nonprofit space is at the pinnacle of that, right? And the best example I can give of this is Jess is one of our star grammar unicorns in the collective. And she was putting forth a contract to do a funding strategy. That is a 12 to 18 month roadmap on what grants to pursue. Can't just start pursuing them. You gotta know which ones to go after. They turned her down for, I think it was like a two or $3,000 project. They said, no, that's too much. So she went back to them and said, wait a minute. So what did I miss here? And she discovered they want to know that they're actually contracting to also pursue the grants not just the funding strategy. So she ended up coming back with the new proposal that was the funding strategy and pursuing two proposals. She ended up actually giving them a proposal for, I think it was like $7,000 and they approved it and she's off and running. They said originally they couldn't afford it, but that's really always, almost always, it's just an excuse. That's not the real reason. The real reason was they were looking for that value to be packaged in a little bit different way, which she listened to and she did it. And then she ended up getting a three times larger contract approved. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about how you really structure your pricing to make sure it's aligned with what your client values. How do I transition my existing clients who are paying per word or hourly to my new pricing structure? New year, baby, set that expectation in all of your future contracts that your rates are updated annually. Also, you can leverage scarcity here. So say for me to give you the best service, I am limiting the number of clients that I'll be taking on in 2023 to six clients or whatever. So here is our new rate structure. Deliver that that clear value proposition in a proposal to them. And frankly, it doesn't have to be customized for every single person. Like you can write this in really even more of a memo format with a clear call to action saying, send back a signed copy of this, affirming that you approve the new rates so that we can continue to work together. That's it, right? So it's not as big of a deal as we think it is. It's usually us that get in our head. Do you know the, how expensive it is for them to go find someone else to do your job? It'll take them months. Can they train them up as well? Like there is a real cost to having to find someone new. Is there a way I can create a pricing formula and apply it to my work? Yes. Create a foot in the door deliverable that is a fixed fee. So we teach that as a funding strategy, which I was just talking about. So charge. $4,000 for a funding strategy to determine what grants to go after for the next 12 to eight months. So they're not wasting their time going after even one that was a waste of time. They had no chance of winning, right? So once you have that, it's, it's, you know, you're getting value. You can give it to them in six to eight weeks and they can implement it even, right? It is a beginning to end beautiful deliverable. 
Then you can give a range of what other common deliverables are that you service. So for instance, and this is where I can show you the exact, literally the exact kind of like ballpark fee ranges that we have updated for 2023. So you have your affordable and fair pricing because we're never charging on low pricing and we have premium pricing, which you get to charge when you're experienced and you deliver a seven star experience. More on that later. So if we're doing a federal grant and I'm an affordable and fair grant writer, mid, you know, kind of early, early mid stage, then I might charge $15,000 for that federal grant. And I would give them a range like this. So you're not having to commit to that value until you know what you're going after or, okay, a letter of inquiry. I can batch four of those. Those would be $1,500 each. So you can give them these ranges to understand we're starting with the original first step deliverable which will inform our future steps. And then I will give you an amended contract. You can literally see what we are seeing people get paid in this industry, no joke, federal grants up to 75 grand per proposal. Granted, those are some very large complex, like $20 million broadband infrastructure grants, but still got a neighbor down the road. Did those all fall? There is your ballpark fees. You're welcome, happy 2023, enjoy them. That's otherwise usually stuff that's totally locked up inside the course. All right, I think that is a wrap. Let's recap. If you've enjoyed this and you feel like you wanna keep learning more, go check out the training that is gonna be linked below on the mistakes to avoid in finding clients and pricing. We go even deeper on this. You can also get a copy of my book on grant writing. I've got a copy back there. You can get it easily. It'll be linked below. Thank you. If you've liked this, hit the like and subscribe comment. I love seeing those. This is a new format of video for us. So I'd love to know what you think. And if you have any other questions, you know where to find us. Alrighty, let's recap because that was a lot of information that probably should have been in a paid webinar. First of all, you're going to stop charging hourly and shift to value-based pricing. When you charge value-based pricing, you're going to be factoring in A, the hours. What's it worth to you? What's it worth to your client? What's that value of your specialized expertise? Number three, there are several ways for you to charge for your services. So get creative and move beyond hourly-based pricing. And number four, you're welcome. Rates that you can be charging as a grant writer in 2023. You know where to learn more if you're interested in exploring that path. All right, friends, that's it. And I will catch you in the next video. See ya.